everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome to my weekly wrap up of September 27th, 2015, wherein I tell you about all the things that I read in the past week in as coherent a way as I possibly can because I haven't been so great at the filming in the past week, so I'm hoping to get back on that horse. Oh shoot, was that a pun? I'm going to be talking about a very horsey book today. <laughs> Oh, let's just get on with it. The first thing that I finished this week was a trade comic. It was Lazarus Volume 1, Family by Greg Rucka. This is uh, another story set in a dystopic future. Uh, seems like the economy, agriculture, possibly the environment, and governments have collapsed, and the world is run by a handful of very powerful, rich families. These families have serfs that they take care of, and the rest of the population, the majority of people on the planet, seem to be what they call waste, which are considered to be expendable, and there is um, a lot of tension between the, the family, who are the haves, and the waste, who are the have-nots. Each of these powerful families has what they call a Lazarus, a person that they take from the family and turn into a super soldier to become their protector. And the Carlisle family's Lazarus is named Forever. She is a daughter of the family, but in the first volume, she has a really bad day and then finds out that her family isn't really her family. I'm actually really keen on continuing the series because I really like the character of Forever. She turned out to be an interesting mix of the super soldier built to fight type of person and then she had these emotional more vulnerable moments she has doubts she wants and craves the love and affection of her family and i really liked seeing this combination but i also don't feel like this i can really judge this series yet by the first volume because it really just seemed like a bunch of character introductions and that was about it it sets up the plot, and I think a lot more stuff is going to happen in the continuing volumes. Next, I read The Privilege of the Sword by Ellen Kushner. Chronologically, this is the second book in the Riverside series coming after uh, Swords Point. So the plot is that the Mad Duke of Tremontaine uh, makes a deal with his sister's family that if they send his niece to live with him and be trained as a swordswoman, for some reason, he will stop trying to ruin his sister's family with these petty lawsuits about land. This seems like a really weak plot when I just say it like that, but it really does make more sense in the moment when you're reading it, when you know about Alec the Mad Duke and his personality and, and how he behaves. And there are explanations later in the story as well. Catherine is initially uh, hesitant and upset about having to dress in boys' clothing and doesn't understand why she needs to learn how to use a sword, but she acquiesces and thinks she becomes uh, not so much resigned but having some fun with her new situation and the people that she gets to meet, but she does get involved in some of the city politics. The nobles of this city um, have the privilege of the sword. They challenge each other to duels over honor. They can um, fight out to their problems by proxy with swordsmen. And this tradition has been a bit watered down since Swords Point. It's usually not duels to the death, but more just like first blood. But Catherine, after learning sword play, uh, does challenge a very powerful lord to a duel because her friend Artemisia was ruined by him before their wedding and she can't get out of the engagement. And this kind of messes or gets involved with Catherine's uncle's, the Mad Duke's plans for the politics of the city because Lord Ferris is like his sword enemy that has had a slightly more YA feel to me, probably because the main character is 15 or 16 years old in this, but it had a lot of that feel from Swords Point. I really enjoyed all the characters. I liked Catherine a lot by the end as well. She was just a little bit emotional and romantic by the end, but she also was really coming into her own and I liked that. I liked her relationship with Marcus. I want an entire book about Marcus now. I really, really liked him. Alec is a very likable, unlikable character. He is 
He's called the Mad Duke for a reason. He seems to do completely nonsensical, insane, debauched things. He has a huge reputation. He corrupts the young. But he also has these moments where he's very sane and sober and serious. And it's like the real Alec coming out from behind his facade. And he's kind of scary. And I like him like that. It makes you realize that he really is playing this game and he is really good at it. He knows what he's doing. He, he always has a plan. So if you're like me and you don't really want to read a lot of epic fantasy right now, if you're into things that involve more intrigue and politics and smaller scale relationships and uh, activities, then the Riverside series would be really good. Next, I finish Winning Colors, which is the third book in this Harris Serrano bindup. I put this down because it's heavy and floppy. One thing that this book does a lot in a couple of the storylines is tackle this issue of the social and economic implications of rejuvenation technology that essentially mean that the older generations that are constantly rejuvenating themselves may never die and they may never turn over their affairs, the family businesses, and power and control over to their children and the younger generations. And there is a faction in this world that really doesn't like that and is making trouble for people involving uh, the corruption of the uh, particular medications uh, used in rejuvenation procedures. There is also a large threat to this part of the world to the Familius Regnant uh, part of the universe where the story takes place because the former king has abdicated disastrously, the government is very weak, and some enemies like a kind of mafia space organization called the Compassionate Hand are beginning to encroach on the familias and attack things, which is where Harris's military training comes in. I also have a really hard time explaining what this book is about because I think a weakness of it is that so much is going on. It feels like Moon has been juggling a lot of balls in these books and she just has too many in this particular story. They're just I mean, it does all come together at the end in a way, and there are some conclusions, especially for um, Harris's estrangement from her parents and her family um, and why they didn't come to support her when she was court-martialed and she had to resign her position. But I just felt like I was stretched thin while reading most of this book. It does have some good points though. I do feel like Harris got a little bit more of a personality and a backstory with the appearance of some of her family members in this book. It's what I've been really hoping for and it worked pretty well. Harris is uh, a much more enjoyable character for me when she is talking to people like Cecilia or to her aunt, the Admiral Serrano, when she is just being alone by herself, being the military person, I don't, I think she's kind of a blank character and I might be misinterpreting her military bearing as being boring when actually she's just very controlled and self-contained. Another high point of this book is that there is finally a battle sequence. There's a very lengthy battle. It was the best part of the book. I think Moon is really, really good at writing intense, well thought out battle scenes in space. That's what I loved about the Vada's War series. And I think that's been missing from the Serrano books so far. And I just got a taste of that and I was like, yes, Moon is very good at doing this. I wanna see more of this. I ended up kind of balancing my likes and dislikes of this book and just giving it three stars. I'm kind of lukewarm about it. I think that I'm gonna be a lot happier when I go to the next couple of books which have a different protagonist, uh, Esme Suiza, who was introduced as a secondary character in Winning Colors and I kinda really wanna know more about her now. And the final novel that I finished this week was Dawn by Octavia E. Butler. This book, guys, <laughs> just tore me in so many different directions. Dawn begins when a woman wakes up on an alien ship orbiting Earth 250 years in the future after a nuclear war has made the Earth uninhabitable and destroyed most of humanity. These aliens called the Oankali have saved as many humans as they possibly can because they are traitors. When they meet other species, they trade with them, mostly in genetics and in DNA makeup. And they want to do a trade with humanity and they're gonna save humanity, they're gonna bring humanity back as a species, but there's a catch. They just might not be human anymore after this trade has been made. And no, 
Humanity didn't really agree to this trade in the first place, but they are caught in a bargain that was not of their own choosing. The Oankali want Lilith to become like a leader, a savior, a mother to the next wave of humans that they release back to the rejuvenated inhabitable earth. And Lilith knows that she can do good, she can be helpful, she can come to the aid of humanity by doing this, but she also knows that she's being set up in a position to be the scapegoat, the traitor to her own race. No matter what she does, she's gonna be blamed by somebody, aliens or humans, and she decides to do this anyway. I liked Lilith for that. She is constantly caught between a rock and a hard place. No decision that she makes will ever be easy and it doesn't seem like a lot of her personal sacrifices or her strength are really rewarded in this book, which makes it tough but also realistic because People aren't nice sometimes. I was pretty bothered by the aliens' um, complete disregard of consent. There are a lot of situations where they, uh, I think, kind of violate humans in various ways uh, by kind of engaging in sexual relations with them slightly against their will. When people say no, there's actually a direct argument that you're saying no to me, but your body is saying yes. I'm sorry. When the, when the head says no, it doesn't freaking matter what, the, what their body is saying yes or not. There are, you know, sometimes your body's reactions are outside of your control, even though you don't want them to be. You know, when somebody says no, that's no. Don't, don't give me that argument that it's okay if your body is saying it's okay. That is a very dangerous argument to be making, and it is a linchpin of a couple of scenes in this book, and it really bothered me. This problem and other issues, other communication problems, other ways of thinking about things does serve to make the aliens feel very alien. They don't think like humans. They don't have the same ethics or morality or ideas about what it means to be a species as humanity does. And that is something to really think about. And finally, let me focus on some positives here. I really did like the character of Lilith. I really sympathized with her. I felt frustrated when she was frustrated. I didn't always agree with what she was doing. Sometimes I wanted her to be a bit stronger in the moment. But overall, I really liked her character and I enjoyed seeing how she dealt with this very challenging situation. I did also end up liking the aliens a lot more by the end of the book, and I like the world building. I am definitely going to be continuing with this series because I want to know what's going to happen now after all this stage has been set. There's also a really surprising kind of disturbing thing that happens at the end of the book, and I want to know how that plays out in the future story. And that's everything that I read this past week. If you have read any of these and you want to talk about them, please comment down below. And I'll be back to talk to you again in my next video. Bye.